on our own. All right. So hang on. Let me just give a little intro. As soon as you screwed up the questions, I want them to know that you screwed that up, not me. <laughs> yeah. Roger. There we go. All right. Let's do it. All right. Describe a challenging situation with a client and how you dealt with it. Every situation with a client is normally challenging. Every client wants something different. Every client wants. Every client doesn't know what they want. I mean, it's quite funny. You ex you expect when you show up on a job that uh, the client would tell you what he wants, but most of the clients don't know. Why that is is because they don't know what products are available. They 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 don't really. They're not really design minded minded in the way that you are. Um, they don't have the same flair as you do for construction. So I mean. It's really difficult to show up on a job where the client doesn't really know what they want because how can you proceed forward? So you really have to take the time before each job to really explain to them their options and what you think would be best under the circumstances given a house that's not straight, what would be the best way to make things look straight or you know, um, a client that wants several different things put into a basement that you know, these things need to be sorted at the beginning. I have a client right now, he's, uh, he's, it is very challenging to work for him. And the main reasons is that we end up having to go backwards. Um, I, I wasn't there for the, the beginning part where the decision search should have been made. And due to a lack of communication, we're proceeding forward. Um, we're, in, we're installing all the walls. Um, all the walls are, are, are finished. Uh, drywall and plastered and now he decides that he wants a heated floor installed. Of course that means tearing down all of the drywall, uh, all, of, all of the plaster in order to fish a wire about a hundred feet. So obviously it's frustrating but you don't show the, the client that. Um, basically my answer to any client is yes I can do it but it's going to take me this much time and it's going to cost you this much money. Um, and then you ultimately leave the decision to them because you know you can't make these decisions for them. Um, in other in other uh, in other examples would probably be uh, clients that when you first show up on the job you demolish everything and all the walls start to go really fast. Uh, all the electricity is run, all of the drywall is run, and the, they see the progress. They really see it. They're like, wow, you really did a good job today. I mean, you guys must have put the hours in. And that's not the case. It's more a case of that the big stuff goes up really fast and it's really easy to do. But when it comes to the, the plastering stage, the finishing stage, the stage that really matters to the client's eye. I mean, they don't really know what's in the wall, so that's down to you. You know, you've got to make sure it's insulated, vapor barrier, and et cetera, et cetera, um, and make sure it's up to code. But a lot of the time, the clients, they, they, when you've worked a day in plastering and, and finishing work, they don't see the progress that you've made. And this can be challenging sometimes because they will send you an email which is not as nice, saying uh, maybe you could put some more hours in or maybe you could work a bit harder. And you have to explain to them very calmly that everything is on schedule and everything is going to plan, we're on time, we're on budget and really put them at ease because that's all they want. They want to be put at ease. So, I mean, like I say, every client is normally challenging in some aspect. You know, it always starts out well, but you know, sometimes they get a bit worried and you have to put them at ease. So that comes down to experience and being able to talk to people, so. Yep. What's the funniest thing that's happened on a job? Well, up to date, I think it, I think it would be uh, you know what, everything is funny on my job. If you can't laugh at yourself, then you can't work on my job. Um, you know, it's really a day-to-day -day thing, whereas people are always screwing up on the job or doing something idiotic. And if you can't laugh at yourself, you're gonna have a problem because there's a lot of banter that goes on. I think a good example would be uh, people who like to spill coffee. You don't ever spill a contractor's coffee. You know what I'm talking about. Eh? <laughs> I hope you're a better contractor than you are. 
than you are a, a coffee uh, a coffee guy. Um, yeah, like he's built my coffee twice in two days. You'd think he'd learn after the first time, but that you know that gives me a license to to really give him give him grief for the next next week, especially after twice. But um, no, I mean there's always something. People drop in paint cans, um, especially after you've just told them. Hey, maybe you should hold that properly because we've just laid down a new floor, and I think uh, I think it would be better if you held that a little bit more secure. And then you walk out the room, and then they drop the paint can on the floor, and they think you're being patronising at the time, but then they feel real, real stupid when they when they actually drop it on the floor, and you're like, yeah, I don't even need to tell tell you how stupid that was. But uh, it's just idiotic things, and and people not really concentrating on what they're doing and, and end up uh, doing something really idiotic so um, yeah I mean you can't really put a, a, a like a, a point on it because something something happens every single day so that's really a difficult question to ask you know it's really like the friendly banter that we get between the guys and, and you know when they mess up we get to laugh at them and if they don't like it unlucky <laughs> yeah go for it what other special skills, talents, experience do you have? I have a lot of experience, a lot of life experience. Uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, mainly my, my life ex experience came before I was a contractor. Um, when I was in the Navy, I, uh, I cheated death um, maybe four times. I'll quickly go over them. The first time was when I was on a, uh, a British nuclear submarine. Um, I actually, uh, we, we, it was my first time on a submarine, I was basically just getting qualified, a uh, wet phase, which means getting qualified at sea to do my job, and yeah, we, we ran the submarine into the ocean floor, and um, you know, it wasn't too bad for me at the time mentally, because I didn't really understand exactly what was going on, because I was new, I, I didn't understand the repercussions of what had just happened. But as time went by, I started to realize as I got more experience in my job, I was like, wow, I really could have died. You know, we, we ripped a massive hole in the submarine, um, 28 million pounds worth of damage, which is a lot of money. And um, yeah, that was the first time that I cheated death. Second time was when I was on HMS Tylus, which was uh, another nuclear submarine. We surfaced into um, an ice, an iceberg. and. Uh, after that, it got renamed Titanic, obviously, HMS Titanic. Um, obviously not really got named, you can't just rename a submarine just like that, but we called it HMS Titanic. Um, we, were, we were coming up to periscope depth with the uh, periscope raised, um, and the periscope actually got hit by an iceberg, it came off and water started coming into the submarine. Uh, that was terrifying. Um, but eventually we managed to surface through the ice and, and, and get through it and we limped back to shore. Um, third time was uh, on HMS Trenchant. We, uh, we were at a deep diving depth which is the maximum depth a submarine can go to and basically um, the shaft seal which is an inflatable seal around the shaft, uh, obviously the propeller that turns, the shaft is obviously attached to a shaft which goes internal on the submarine. When that shaft turns, you need something to seal around that shaft to stop the water coming in. That's inflatable. That burst, and we were we were actually going maximum revs when that burst to be able to reach the surface. Maximum revolutions on the propeller to propel ourselves out of the water as fast as possible. And we blew main ballast, uh, put as much air into the tanks as possible. At that point, we're supposed to be able to surface really fast. You will really feel it. Um, but I was looking at the depth gauge and we are actually going backwards, we were going deeper and that scared the life out of me um, to realize that we were doing the maximum to surface and we were still going backwards then that was the most scared I've ever been in my life and that was, uh, that was just before I finished my naval career um, so that, that kind of affected me a little bit about you know, the safety of submarines and that's why I didn't join the Navy when I came to Canada um, because we all, we all know about the Chikudami, so and that's a British submarine as well, so I didn't think it would be a good idea to, to go on that. Um, the fourth time that I had a little deal with death would have been um, 
during the Iraqi war, the Iraqi conflict as we call it. Um, I was transporting um, military equipment to Kuwait uh, on merchant vessels and we, there's always one point, one area in which pirates are always very close, you know, they like to capture merchant vessels, especially if there's a good, you know, an expensive cargo on board. On board. And yeah, they, they tried to attack us in between Yemen and Somalia, firing uh, weapons at the ship, um, bullets flying everywhere, and um, we had obviously had to return fire. Um, they tried to get on board, but we managed to hose them down with um, big fire hydrants and stuff like that. So that was pretty scary as well, because if they'd have taken us, they could have, you know, they would have taken us hostage and who knows what would have happened. But we knew what we were doing and uh, we took care of business. So, yeah, it was uh, quite a scary time that was. Um, yeah, like I say, most of my experiences come through the Navy um, and obviously growing up as well. Um, you, you, you know, my, my life growing up was more strict, so it made me more mature from a younger age, uh, more equipped to deal with intense situations, um, made me more communicative with, with my, you know, like nowadays when I'm talking to my clients, they really trust me and they have confidence in me. Just purely, I believe, because of the way that I talk. I talk with confidence, I talk like I know what I'm talking about. And um, yeah, I mean, a lot of things in my life have prepared me um, for, you know, they've made me the, the person I am today. And um, I'm thankful for those experiences. I mean, I'm only 27 and, you know, things are going really well in my life. And hopefully I can, uh, I can take my career to the next level. I would love to be the Gordon Ramsay of construction, you know, the Gordon Ramsay homes, as it were. So I definitely hope that uh, you would consider me for this role. Is, uh, is that all the questions? Or? That's it. All right. So that's it. Index on that one. <laughs>